Welcome. Good evening. Thank you for joining us for Story Hour in the Library. Uh, we'd like to welcome you into the Morrison Library and hope that you enjoy our reading tonight. If you want to find out more information about Story Hour in the Library, you can visit our website, storyhour.berkeley.edu, or you can sign up at the front. We have an email list, and we notify you of all of our different readers. Um, feel free to join us next month for our Story Hour in the Library with Porter Shreve on December 3rd at 5 p.m. back here in the Morrison. And also, we would like to let you know that we will be selling Julia's books for $10 up the front, and she is willing to sign them afterwards. So definitely get yourself a copy. We have her first and second novel here for sale. And at this time, if you can silence your cell phones, and I'd like to introduce Melanie uh, to do the introduction. Just because I'm going to be that annoying English professor person, collect nonfiction books, not novels. <laughs> OK. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Julia Shears to the Story Hour. Julia received a BA in Spanish from Calvin College in Michigan and a master's in journalism from the University of Southern California. She lives in Berkeley with her husband and two daughters. Um, Julia was born and raised in rural India, Indiana. See, where's my mind? That's me. My husband, that is. And it's this landscape that is part of the backdrop to her first book, a memoir titled Jesus Land, which was published in 2005. In Jesus Land, Julia tells the story of growing up in a very conservative Calvinist family with two adopted African-American brothers. Julia's parents first adopt three-year-old David because they are guilt-tripped by an adoption agency, which is run out of white children. But Julia, who is also three, bonds with David instantly, and Jesus Land tells the story of this profound, resilient sibling love as David and Julia face the racism of their parents and the culture they live in. They are chased out of public pools and refuse service in restaurants. <coughs> David is subjected to harsh corporal punishment and later sent to a Christian reform school in the Dominican Republic. Julia follows him there, and we quickly see that this reform school is really a brutal prison and re-education camp, complete with barbed wire. Her description of David and her experiences prompted the New York Times to write, it is Shear's high emotion and her tight control of her narrative within that emotion that is most striking. Her anger serves her well. It is focused, justified, and without a trace of self-pity. The review of her publishers weekly wrote, tinged with sadness yet pervaded by a sense of triumph, Shear's book is a crisply written and earnest examination of the meaning of family and Christian values and announces the author as a writer to watch. Jesus Land was a New York Times and London Times bestseller and also one of my favorite memoirs. Um, Julia's second book, A Thousand Lives, The Untold Story of Jonestown, was published in 2012. We've all heard about the Reverend Jim Jones and his orchestration of the deaths of more than 900 men, women, and children in 1978, but Julia bases her telling on some 50,000 pages of letters, journals, and other documents recovered from Jonestown and only recently released by the FBI. As the New York Times put it, the result is a gripping account of how decent people can be taken in by a charismatic and crazed tyrant. The LA Times wrote, it's hard to imagine how people might be so browbeaten, afraid, and misled that they would bring about their own deaths, but Shears has made that terrifying story believable and human. In my opinion, A Thousand Lives is a stunning combination of journalistic research and primary materials and imaginative compassion and empathy. It is a heartbreaking and searing read. A Thousand Lives was named a book, best book of the year by several newspapers and won the Northern California Independent Booksellers Nonfiction Book of the Year Award in 2012. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Julia. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks for the invite and thanks for showing up. I almost didn't make it. I almost got into a bad car accident on the way here, but whew, here now and happy to be here. So I just wanted to take a quick vote because there's a lot of younger members in the audience. How many here are familiar with the Jonestown Massacre of November 18, 1978? Okay. And those who aren't familiar with it? A couple? OK. So this is what happened. On November 18, 1978, a preacher from, from San Francisco had brought 
his congregation down to Guyana, South America, and on that date, he forced them to drink a cyanide-laced punch. It was the largest mass murder-suicide in modern history. Okay. So my book traces everything that happens up to that point. Everyone has heard the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid, right? It's now part of our cultural lexicon. And, and what does that mean? It means that you have been tricked or you're not very smart. You drank the, cor the corporate Kool-Aid. You were naive. And to me, this is a very offensive term because my argument, my central argument of a thousand lives is that people didn't willingly die, but that they were murdered by Jim Jones. That he brought them down to Guyana and sequestered them in the middle of the jungle with this sole intent, which was to go down in history and, and kill his followers. Back here in the Bay Area, he discussed several times doing it in other ways. He sent one of his lovers to flight school and she learned how to fly a plane, but she never learned how to land it. Uh, the idea was that they were going to load people onto an airplane and then crash it into the ocean. They talked about, he talked with his inner circle about loading people onto buses and driving off the Golden Gate Bridge. So there were a core group of people who knew about Jim Jones' intentions to kill everyone, but the rank and file members of People's Temple thought that they were going down to Guyana to participate in this great socialist experiment. You gotta remember, this was the 70s, and so they were trying to build a utopia where there would be no sexism or racism, elitism. And for me, the rank and file members who followed Jim Jones down to Guyana went there because they were idealists. And that's who I focus on in my book. Jim Jones wanted to go down in history, he did. There's been a lot of books written about him. And every time there's an anniversary, you'll see former leaders of People's Temple, his church, in the media talking about what happened down there. They have a very different view of what happened to the regular members of Jim's church, Jones's church. So, I'm gonna briefly play you a kind of a book trailer that I put together based on home movies from People's Temple in Jonestown. Now mind you, I am not an animator. I do not work for Pixar. I am merely an author. So it's, just, it's not that slick, but you get an idea of, of what Jonestown looked like. So let me see. Blackout peas, more peas. We have different containers around the place. We couldn't go through all the tremendous inventory. They built up Kool-Aid, icing, frost icing, various kind of uh, cookies. These are filled with crackers back here. Of course, this is a soda pop. Eight coops, all filled with chickens. See the automatic water feeders and how clean the floor base we have so that we have lost no chickens whatsoever. Miracle. Miracle of miracles. This is the hottest part of the uh, entire year. And uh, they're doing real well. We've not lost any chickens. Move your hands. Move your hands. I can't see. The American man is nothing like these.
of us here are so extremely happy. I, I've never been so totally happy or fulfilled in my life. We have beautiful trees, all the fruit, all the flowers, we eat all the vegetables and everything. We raise ourselves and we, we, are, we are happy out here doing these things. We have everything. It's the most marvelous experience in my life to have an apostolic way of life, a real apostolic way of life, where there's no pressures that you feel, in, like in the States. There's no racism here. I, just, I am really grateful to be a part of this family and to be, able to, be, to be able to have the privilege to come down to the Promised Land to help build a better society for the people. So you can see from the emphasis on food, right? Did you hear the cameraman saying, get your hands out of the way, I can't see it? Jim Jones, you know, doing the tour of the pantry. Look at all this food we have. Look at the beautiful nursery we have. Look at the, the seniors doing their exercises. The cameraman saying, smile. This all, all of this footage is what he was showing in People's Temple in, on Geary Street in San Francisco as he's trying to get people to come down, right? This, the problem was, or what was happening in reality, is that there wasn't enough food in Jonestown. They couldn't grow enough food. They didn't know what they were doing. There were too many people. There was overcrowding. They were going hungry. Families were told that they could live together in their own cottages in Jonestown, and that they could leave whenever they wanted to if they didn't like it. Well, what happened? They get down to Jonestown, Jim Jones takes away their passports and says, if you want to go home, you can swim home because I ain't paying your way home, right? It was all an elaborately staged way to get people to join him down there, to trap them in the jungle. Here in the Bay Area, Jones was an esteemed player. He was like Cecil Williams of Glide. He had this wonderfully integrated church. He was a power broker. He helped get George Moscone, the, the mayor of San Francisco, elected in 1975, Harvey Milk. He ran a soup kitchen. He gave free medical care to the poor, free child care. He was doing a lot of good. But when he got down to Jonestown, he dropped that demeanor of the benevolent preacher, and he showed his true self. So I'm going to read a brief portion of the book. Um, this is the first time that Jim Jones brings up this notion of revolutionary suicide in public. Okay. It wasn't until they moved from the Bay Area to Guyana that he mentioned his idea of revolutionary suicide or dying for socialism and to protest capitalism, as he called it. On December 9, Jim Jones's mother died of emphysema in Jonestown. A few hours after her death, an emotional Jones summoned his followers to the pavilion. He described his mother's last moments as she gasped for air with her tongue hanging out and saliva flowing down her face. He invited people who knew Lynetta to take a last look at her. 
Although she looked horrific while she died, he said that in death she looked very well, very well indeed. Lynetta was the one person Jones allowed to call his bluff and get away with it. When she died, another moderating influence vanished and another cord tethering Jones to reason snapped. A few weeks later, in the middle of a rambling screed, he abruptly asked his followers, how many of you plan your death? There was a stunned silence. Don't you ever plan your death? He repeated impatiently. There's a number of you who do not lift your hand and say you plan your death. You're gonna die. Don't you think you should plan such an important event? He called on a 75-year-old Texan named Vera Talley. Sister Talley, don't you ever plan your death? On a tape recording of the conversation, she sounds hesitant. No, she finally said. And why don't you, dear? Jones asked. I don't know, I just hadn't thought about it. Don't you think it's time to think about it? It's a terrible thing to have it be an accident, like I saw my mother, to be wasted and just laid in a box. I think it's kind of a waste, don't you think? The old woman was confused. She thought Jones was talking about life insurance. My husband quit paying it and I didn't have no money to pay it and I just let it go and I haven't thought about it no more. I'm not talking about insurance, Jones said. I'm talking about planning your death for the victory of the people, for socialism, for communism, for black liberation, for oppressed liberation. Haven't you ever thought about taking a bomb and running into a Ku Klux Klan meeting and destroying all the Ku Klux Klan people? The microphone buzzed loudly, angering Jones. He ordered the people sitting at the back to stop playing with their babies and pay attention. Maya Imes, an eight-year-old biracial girl with a cloud of soft black hair, raised her hand. She too was confused. What does planning your death mean? She asked sweetly. On the tape, her voice is shockingly innocent and clear. In his response to Maya, Jones launched into a diatribe whose essence was captured in this sentence. A healthy person has to think through his death or they may sell out. This was Jim Jones' deepest fear that his followers would sell out or betray him if they left his church. He'd rather they die first. When somebody's so principled, they're ready to die at the snap of a finger, he continued, and that's what I want to build in you, that same type of character. He began talking about various ways of dying. Drowning, they say, is one of the easiest ways in the world to die. It's just a numbing kind of sleepy sensation. The crowd was solemn and their lack of enthusiasm infuriated him. Some of you people get so fucking nervous every time I talk about death, he shouted. He stuck out his tongue and pretended to gag, just as he'd seen his own mother do as she died. The crowd laughed uneasily. An elderly woman refused to smile at his antics and he turned on her. You're gonna die someday, honey, he bellowed. You old bitch, you're gonna die. He started keeping track of those people who refused to vote for what he called revolutionary suicide or who, or who were too attached to their children. He told the medical team to find a way to kill, to kill the nearly 1,000 residents of Jonestown and told them to be creative. There weren't enough bullets to shoot everyone. Annie Moore, Jones' personal nurse, wrote him a note with several suggestions. It would be terrorizing for some people if we were to have them all in a group and start chopping heads off or whatever. This is why it would have to be done secretly, she wrote. What a slap in the face to fascists it would be to take our own lives before they could have the pleasure of it. She recommended poisoning their food or the wells, or venting gas fumes in, into an enclosed area. 
Michigan native Shirley Fields, 40, who lived in Jonestown with her husband and two children and worked as a dietitian, suggested they starve themselves to death. Marceline Jones was also a nurse, and she argued that although the adults were free to choose their fate, the children should be spared. For many years, I've lived with just one reason, and that was to safeguard the lives of our children, she wrote her husband. If some asylum could be arranged for our children, especially the babies and preschool children, they could be saved for socialism because they are young enough to adjust to a new culture and language. But Jones had no interest in his wife's opinions. The holidays were especially trying. On Christmas Day, 1977, which for the vast majority of Jonestown residents would be their last, Jones baited people by asking if anyone was homesick for California. Several people raised their hands and Jones called them before the crowd to denounce them as elitists and miserable capitalists. He even got out of his chair and struck one man repeatedly on the face. Also confronted that day was Rose McKnight, a 24-year-old woman from San Diego. McKnight had arrived a few weeks earlier and was angry that her two-year-old son had been taken from her and put into a dorm with the other toddlers. She was also deeply afraid of Joan's constant suicide talk. If I'd known it was going to be like this, I would have never have come, she remarked to a bunkmate. For this counter-revolutionary remark, she was forced to do field work from dawn to dusk in the glaring tropical heat. Worse than this physical punishment was the emotional torment of being cut off from her son. She'd sometimes see him being led around the compound by strangers, and if he turned his small face to her and held out his arms, she forced herself to look away. She ached for him, but she had no choice but to silence her instincts, maternal and otherwise. Thus began Rose McKnight's re-education. She learned, as many others had, to do and say the unnatural. Shortly after she was released from the hard labor crew, she wrote her husband a letter. She did not mention her ordeal, but marveled instead at the food prepared in the compound's kitchen. Wait till you taste our Jonestown. Cassava cookies, cassava cornbread, donuts, bread, biscuits, all expertly made in our wood-burning ovens. They are the best you have ever eaten, and you know how I love donuts. Her husband would arrive in February, enticed by his wife's breezy missives, and completely unaware of the terror that was brewing in Jonestown. You might have noticed in the footage all those videos that they had of the people as well, saying it was the best experience, they'd never been more happy in their lives. All of that was scripted and orchestrated. And as I was researching the book, you know, going through 50,000 pages of files, I found countless notes to Jim Jones from families begging for him to release them, to let them come back to California promising to give them their paychecks for the rest of their lives, to give the family jewels, whatever, just to let them go. And of course, their pleas fell on deaf ears. So I guess what I felt was important as I was writing this book was to speak up for Jim Jones's victims, you know, who have been stigmatized over the decades by the media and even in our greater culture with that phrase, drinking the Kool-Aid. I think people need to remember that not only on the November 18, 1978, we're coming up on the 37th anniversary, not only were the people, the residents of Jonestown, surrounded by armed guards with guns pointed at them and given the choice that they could either drink the potion and go quietly to the other side, or they could be shot, so they didn't have a choice. They could either die by poison or they could be shot to death in front of their family. But they should also remember that a third of the people who died were children. They were minors, most of whom are buried 
and a mass grave at Evergreen Cemetery in Oakland, California, and whose little bodies were never identified. Uh, I know we don't have much time, so I'm going to open it up for questions. Thank you. Sure. They did. After so, you know, it's a long, involved story, which is why I wrote a book. But basically, what happened was that their r rumors got out. Um, allegations that people were being held against their will, which they were. So a congressman from San Mateo named Leo Ryan decided to go down and investigate these allegations. He went into Jonestown with this entourage of reporters on November 17, and they were treated to the song and dance. Um, they rehearsed for weeks for this visit. Jim Jones would have nightly meetings where he would rehearse people on the answers to various questions. Well, what do you eat in Jonestown? Well, tell them you eat pork and you eat chicken and you eat steak. They didn't eat enough food. You know, it, it was all very rehearsed. And so then what happened was that as the entourage was getting ready to leave, somebody slipped Congressman Ryan's assistant, who was Jackie Spears and is now in his seat, a note saying, please help us get out of Jonestown. And then that started this whole rush of people who wanted to leave with Congressman Ryan. Jim Jones realized that his house of cards was falling. And as Congressman Ryan left with the first group of Jonestown residents who wanted to leave, they arrived to this jungle airstrip. And as they were waiting to board their planes, Jim Jones sent his security guards with guns and uh, gunned down Congressman Ryan, killing him and several reporters as well. After that happened, the security guards went back to Jonestown and then they started the last, what happened the last night. And they also drank the poison. They drank the poison as well. But Jim Jones, noticeably, after watching the people die in agony after drinking cyanide, because it wasn't as he said, like falling asleep and drifting off to the other side. He told them that they would be reincarnated. It was a horrible way to die. So after he witnessed this, he shot himself and took the easy route out. So when you, I'm assuming you also were able to talk to the few people that were able to escape. And I did. what is their take on how they were able to, you know, either get the, you know, emotional gumption to go, or or the um, the physical space to get out. Like, how did those few people that were able to escape manage? Well, it's interesting. There was so there was a group of residents who hiked out on the morning of November 18 which was amazing. There was a whole family, um, the Owens family, I believe where you know, Jones split up families because he wanted to weaken that family bond. He wanted the loyalty to be to the cause and to him. So he would have the husbands and wives living in separate cottages. He'd remove their children from them. But these families managed somehow to plan to escape together. And the same thing happened with one of my main um, sources, Tommy Bogue and his father, Jim Vogue, who is one of the pioneers of Jonestown, they, you know, they talked about it with their family, and they, you had to be very careful if you confided in someone that you wanted to leave Jonestown, you could get in serious trouble. He used Thorazine to drug dissenters. He had a medical center where he would just dope people up on Thorazine, and so they were, you know, they, they couldn't think anymore. They were mentally jailed. So it, it was very harrowing. And there's, you know, one of the stories I tell is about uh, Tommy Bogue and his, who was 15 at the time, and his friend, Brian Davis, who was also 15, tried to run away from Jonestown in November 1977, so a year before the massacre happened. 
And they were best friends and they planned, like, we got to get out of here. We don't want to die. So on the last, they were caught by the Jonestown security. They didn't get very far. But on the last day, as Tommy was leaving with his father and Congressman Ryan with that entourage, Brian Davis also wanted to leave, but his father is holding him back because he was a minor. So I found a lot of you know, heartbreaking stories like that of husband who wanted to leave and save the family, but the wife was a true believer and wanted to stay. And a lot of you know, divisions between family members that couldn't talk to each other and couldn't confide because everyone was so afraid of being caught. Oh, hi. Um, didn't the basketball team escape too? Because they were away. I was, in, I was in San Francisco when it happened. Oh, wow. I remember mm. that time, there's no time like it in that yeah. area ever, yeah. in my opinion, because when Moscone and Milk were killed in the same period, people thought it was connected to Jonestown. Mm -hmm. It was like the end of innocence in San Francisco, later, in my opinion, because yeah. everything happened that November. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And when this was happening to Jonestown, people knew Jonestown. You know, the, the, the uh, People's Temple in San Francisco, you knew it, you saw it. Mm -hmm. They were on TV. Mm -hmm. Jim, Jim Jones was on TV, like on the news, just like a regular right. politician or something yeah. before that. So, and people were aware, I mean, they emptied out the Fillmore. Because so many of the people that went to Jonestown were from that yeah. area. So many people that went to Jonestown were poor, were black. You know, it was just devastating. I think that's, that's the greatest tragedy, that betrayal, and I think you hit it on the head. I mean, it was a special era in U.S. history when there was this sense in the 70s in San Francisco of, of wanting to do something to help, you know, it was like the next stage of the civil rights movement, to have this, this militant church, to have this white man saying, you know, going around the pews of his church and saying, no, 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 no. He, he, he did. He came across as like he was anti yeah. Oh yeah. Well, like you said, he had a lot of political clout. He got he got Moscone and Milk elected, and then he was named the head of the housing authority. He did, but again, when he went to Jonestown, you know, he dropped all of that demeanor. He started using a lot of drugs. He started cursing, as you heard me read in that excerpt. You know, before he would go up to the little ladies and compliment them and be very sweet, all of that was just gone. It was terrifying. You can listen to some of these tapes that the FBI collected, and he can just turn in an instant from like a normal voice to a just, you know, a, a, a maniac. Like you know. said, see, the times, it's hard for people to understand it in a way, but the times were different. They had yeah. a lot to do with why people followed him. Yeah. Because of the idealistic times, the period of the yeah. 70s, of how people were just searching for something like they were more introspective in a certain way. Even though they called the me generation, people were looking for something within a lot, deeper yeah. in a certain way, they thought. And the, the times had a lot to do with why people were able to, he was able to do what he did. And people were just coming out of the civil rights period, yeah. just coming out of the 60s. They were more vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely, I completely agree. You know, I, I think there was a lot of feeling that the civil rights movement didn't go far enough, and that Jim Jones was, a, he considered himself a civil rights leader. You know, and people wanted to rally around that cause. So the, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. They're nice. Did they make it out, or they're nice? No, they didn't make it out. But they were on tape. I was able to piece together individual stories from, again, from like scraps of papers, um, immigration records, audio. Um, it, was, it took me a year just to read through the FBI materials and figure out, you know, how to structure the book and a chronology, you know. Because the FBI released the um, documents on three CDs. And so a letter that might have started on CD1, page 23, might end on CD3, page 59, for example. It, it was just, it was chaos. So it's piecing these together. But the main characters that I follow, that I emphasize in the book, did make it out or left behind some primary source, like, you know, one woman kept a diary in Jonestown. So I could talk about what daily life was like for her there. There was. That's great. So what do you know about Jones' background besides the 
before he started in San Francisco? Where was he born and what kind of family life did he have? Um, he came from Indiana. I'm also from Indiana. Um, it's, it's part of what led me to the book. Um, there were several things. There was the religious element. I grew up in a very religious household that was integrated and was from Indiana. So there were a lot of uh, parallel interests here. Um, so Jim Jones was brought up in a tiny town, unhappy um, parents. Uh, he was an only child. His father was a World War I vet who was disabled. His mother was a union organizer who liked to drink and smoke and didn't go to church. So he saw him, always saw himself as an outsider and had some of these impulses, say, for you know, equal justice back in the day. But I think the real puzzle is you know, whether he had this message of equal rights and social justice and was able to accumulate a following because he believed in it or whether he used this message because he knew there were a lot of people who wanted to hear it. Yeah. Was there a core theological content to his message? I mean, what, where was yeah. that coming from? What, what was that based in? Well, the interesting thing is he started out as a Methodist preacher in Indianapolis. And then he became more and more radical. He, like many cult leaders, he reread the Bible. He saw a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of violence. And he put it aside and ultimately said, I can do more for you than this book or your God can do. I am going to create some real change in this world. We're going to create this force, this movement, you know, here, now. It's not going to be some faraway place in heaven. So again, that, that message appealed to a lot of people who were frustrated and impatient and who wanted the same things that he did, the social justice. Yes. You know, it, she wants to know if, if I heard correctly if there were any rescue attempts of residents in Jonestown. Right. Well, uh, Jim, see, the thing is, once, and I took the, I went down the river journey. They, they took this two day boat ride into you know, up the jungles of, of Guyana, a virgin rainforest. It was very remote. There was no telephone. There was one ham radio. <clears throat> All of the letters going out were censored. They couldn't say anything bad about what was happening in Jonestown. And all of the letters in were also censored. So again, they were just completely cut off from society in a way that I think would be impossible to, to replicate today. When I went down to Jonestown in uh, Port Kaituma, the, the village that is closest to Jonestown, I went down there when I was researching my book, and I had better cell phone reception there than I have here in Berkeley. <laughs> Go figure. So. When the politician came in and people started coming forward saying, I want out, it's a sham, that was it. That was the day that Jim Jones gathered everyone and, and forced them to drink the Flavor Aid. It wasn't Kool Aid, it was Flavor Aid, a cheap knockoff of Kool Aid. Yes. Um, because he did uh, support, or at least was an advocate for socialism, did this have a tragedy ever been politicized in the media? In the sense of like, we might see today. Oh, yeah, he was interviewed. He was, he was a val very outspoken man, as April uh, said. He, he, was, he, was a, he was a media figure. He was a, you know, a leader. He was considered a leader in, in the Bay Area and on the topic of social justice. Anyone else?
like, like this is what socialism means. Oh, of course. Okay. Oh, of course. Yeah, you know. Oh, completely. Because he perverted the notion of what equality and social justice should be. He betrayed the people who believed in this dream. And that's, that's the most tragic thing, you know? And I wish I could have included more voices in my book, but my editor is like, stop. You know, again, I found so many notes to him begging to come back to California. And I felt responsible for giving those people a voice because they have been maligned and stigmatized for so long. But there were just, there were too many to count. So I, I hope people come away from my book with a new uh, understanding of what actually happened down there. Well, it's interesting. I, I was actually pregnant when I was writing the book. And I remember my, some friends saying, are you afraid that you know, this dark material is going to somehow contaminate your unborn child? And um, she's the most wonderful, happy, joyful little kid you'd ever meet, so no. Um, yes, it did seep over into my subconscious, my dreams. I would have, you know, I would have nightmares about being a mother in Jonestown in line, you know, looking for a way to escape, but it'd always be my hometown church, you know, when <laughs> I was trying to crawl out a window or something. But yeah, but yeah, definitely. I had some strange things happen to me while I was writing the book. Some weird kind of woo-woo stuff that I'm not going to get into here, but you can ask me about later. <laughs> yes? Uh, look, yeah, looking at this as, as literature, though, how, how do you... How do you see what you did there as putting the conversation today in a perspective that is illuminating on the transition out of the period we're talking about until now? Because we've seen a massive effort to kind of contextualize the free speech movement, uh, the Manson murders, and Jonestown. I saw a documentary on Jonestown that was very, very, very thorough and doc well documented. Are you talking about the Stanley Nelson documentary? Yeah, I think so. It's been a while, so I can't really remember all the details. But I, you know, I think there there was a, a tremendous resist, a reactionary uh, reaction to you know to the '60s. How to contextualize it? How to give it a sense? And I, I in many ways, I don't think that's just because I think there are many stories there, mm -hmm. and it was a, it needs more. Maybe it's too soon to actually. Speak of that in in measured tones, but at the, you know it doesn't. We don't get the same kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, interesting entertainment value out of you know lynching of, lynchings of Negroes in the South or uh, the McCarthy trials. I mean, we, we hear that yes, that's that that was nasty and everything, and then it just kind of sits there and doesn't really doesn't really muddy up the story. I mean, Reagan came in here and fired Clark Kerr and did a lot of really negative things about the university. That a lot of us who were around at the time, I wasn't here at the free speech movement, but it was still the, uh, the, oppress the oppressive, uh, the turning of Reagan on, you know, on the university and on young people was, was what made his political career. So, and, and that, that, that really put a stamp on these, uh, these events. So how does your, how does your book, to get back to this question, how does your book search to give a, contextualize this story for today? I think that's outside of the realm of my book. What I was trying to do was to give a, you know, a, a narrative, nonfiction take, you know, to talk about what happened day to day, what was life like in Jonestown. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, leave that, I leave that to the historians. I'm not a historian, I am a journalist. Um, and there's been a lot of academic books written about like African Americans and the People's Temple or, or homosexuals and People's Temple. Um, but I wanted to reveal for the reader what it was like to believe in these, 
you know, these, these glowing isms of socialism and racial justice and, um, and then to get down to Jonestown believing that if you didn't, you could check it out, didn't like it, you could go home. And then being down there, all of a sudden having your, your, your leader saying we must commit this thing called revolutionary suicide and then goading people towards it night after night and meanwhile there's not enough to eat, you're separated from your family, he's showing them all of these really depressing movies. It was all this mental beatdown. He would show them movies about experiments during the Holocaust. It was like he was trying to contaminate them with his very dark and nihilistic worldview. Trying to get them to the point where they would believe suicide was better than another day on this earth. So to go from this dream of this utopia to we must, we must die. And he couldn't he couldn't do that. The families, you know, they still loved each other. He couldn't, he couldn't break those bonds. So what I set out to do was to show, again, what it was like for these five people once they realized that they were trapped in Jonestown and Jim Jones was intent on killing them. What was their internal reaction? You know, what did they do? What did they plan? To me, that was what was interesting. Um, yes, um, so the thing about the Jonestown massacre, the mass murder suicides, there's a lot of controversy. There are a lot of people who believe it was all a CIA experiment or there's that and the other. So for me, it was really important to get those facts straight. That's why there are many, many pages of endnotes at the end of my book. So. If you ever wonder as you're reading it, well, how does she know that? Well, go look in the end note um, because I wanted to, to be rigorously sourced. Um, so, you know, when you're discovering the facts, you know, I'd be going through the FBI files and there'd be like, you know, a shipping manifest, 50 pages long, and you're looking through it. And then all of a sudden, you know, the word cyanide leaps out. So there were those aha moments um, with the facts. But then, you know, what I've come to enjoy more as I move along in my career is the, the storytelling element. So really giving a mood or a tone to my writing. And I find that that comes in the last drafts. You know, first you got to get the story down, you got to get the chronology down, you got to get the structure down. And then in the last drafts, you can go back and you can massage the sentences and give it that more um, artistic tone. So. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. When you started this project, before you ever started reading the FBI files, I mean, I don't know which came first. I assume you, I, I remember reading something you wrote about having seen, heard that the FBI files were available. Yeah. Decided you wanted to write that. Jim Jones is such a charismatic figure, and I wonder, was he at all a sympathetic figure for you, mm -hmm. if you when you first started the project? And was there a turning point? Like, did he just become sicker and sicker to you as he went? Or was did you started out with him being not at all sympathetic? Like, how, how that's, did your relationship with Jim Jones yeah. that's a good That's a good question. Um, I hated writing about Jim Jones. I hated it. My editor has to t had to tell me, no, you need to include more. <laughs> I would just get so impatient and angry because I hated him so much for what he did. And it was really hard just to struggle through like some background on his family background and where he came from. Also, you know, that's what he wanted. He wanted to go down in history. He called himself the great anti-hero. Um, and there'd been many books written about him. He got his wish. So I felt like when I was writing about him, I was, I was granting him this wish and it made me angry. Um, but then I grew very attached to the five main sources, people that I follow through into Jonestown. And in fact, I'm a really, I'm on, uh, very good friends with one of the sources, um, 
named Tommy Bogue, who was a teenager when he was sent down there. He has a mechanic shop up in Dixon, California. It's about an hour north of here. So, A1 Choice Automotive. <laughs> Go there. He will tell you all about his experiences in, in Jonestown. So. Well, thank you very much. That'll thank you. It.